It's good to be with everyone here on today's program. Just covering this week for my colleague Adam. Don't worry, he'll be back in two weeks' time to continue hosting. Uh, but really, my pleasure to be back with you here. And we have a, another great panel today. We're going to cover a wide variety of topics that I think will be of interest to everyone here on today's program. And, and before we go into that, I do want to just give a little, little bit of background on COVID, as we like to do, and where things stand right now across our country and, and in New York State. So uh, the slides that I like to use are typically from the uh, Johns Hopkins Center and their CDC tracking um, area which uh, contains a lot of valuable information. You'll see from the next slide, which focuses on the nationwide uh, statistics. Uh, I went back to April, which is, um, uh, I think I did a few more programs after that, but was one of the, the last ones that I came in on. And uh, you see where we were at from a timeline standpoint in April, beginning of April, our seven day average was about 19,000. We had 23,000 or so cases obviously still well below the peak that we saw in January uh, with the Omicron and Delta variants. Uh, but since then, we've seen uh, those numbers tick up, uh, certainly some variability since then, and, and more recently, some, some positive negative trends, uh, but we're still uh, well above uh, the seven-day average that we saw in April. Uh, and our aggregate number of cases are also significantly higher. So. Uh, we'll, of course, want to continue to keep an eye on this. Uh, fortunately, no major spikes like we saw before here in the historical data. Just to give you a, on the next slide a little bit of um, additional sense of the trends right now, I think uh, the trends here uh, of late, uh, certainly for the last two months, again, I think are generally positive. We see the case numbers declining. Um, you know, we don't see a major increase in the death trends, which also is a lagging indicator. So that's consistent with that. And and also we see uh, the admissions declining for hospitalizations as well. All good news, uh, I think, in terms of the trends and hopefully that continues. Here in New York, uh, uh, we're seeing our, our own trends. The next slide will, will have the, the current timeline for you as well. Uh, I, I think we haven't seen um, here in New York quite the same spike that is being seen elsewhere in the country, or at least when you consider the country as a whole. Our seven-day average is, is higher um, and not it's significantly higher, but uh, when you look at the actual numbers, uh, we're just going up from 3,500 to 4,400 uh, in terms of the seven-day daily average and uh, an increase as well in our number of cases, uh, but the overall uh, number you know, still uh, a far cry from what we're seeing nationally. Uh, so again, hopefully those trends uh, continue. In terms of the CDC's community level, uh, we see uh, a snapshot that I included uh, back when I presented it in April. Uh, we saw a state that was almost entirely uh, low and green, which was good news, but we did have some concentration at that time in central New York, as it turned out. Uh, the, the snapshot to the right is, is taken again from the CD's website today. Uh, that shows that we continue to have low rates across a large uh, majority of upstate New York with some uh, moderate rates and then uh, higher rates down in, close to the city and on Long Island. Uh, so uh, that's consistent with what we're seeing in terms of the statistics that I shared. Uh, hopefully, uh, when I'm back on, maybe in a few months, the guest host again, we'll have a state that's uh, entirely green, green, certainly my hope there, uh, as well as yours, I'm sure. Okay, uh, there was one piece of notable information that you may have seen in the news. Uh, again, this is uh, one of those things that tends to get twisted uh, when you see the reports in the media, you know, CDC pulling back on quarantine guidelines or quarantine requirements. And I even saw some conflating with the term isolation, which, as you know, we've, we've come to construe with meaning you're actually infected um, with the virus. Uh, and not much else in terms of data and information that was getting pushed out. So um, I'm gonna push out a link to the information from the CDC's website so that you have it. But this new guidance really focused on the issue of quarantining. And quarantining, um, again, a term that has been tossed around in a lot of different ways, but the meaning that typically is applied these days, and that is applied with respect to the CDC's guidance, uh, as well as to state guidance here in New York, it means that you've been exposed to someone right, in close contact for a sufficient period of time and within a sufficient distance 
who is positive. Uh, and now um, versus requiring somebody actually stay at home, uh, now what the CDC is recommending is that as long as you wear a high quality mask or a respirator uh, for a period of time afterwards, 10 days and get tested after five days, you don't need to quarantine, in other words, stay at home uh, and out of, the, out of the community if you're merely exposed. So uh, the link I'm gonna send you contains the full guidance I included just a snippet of some of the other guidance that's been in place here, just so you have that as a reference. But again, this is one of those things that the requirements will continue to evolve and change. And uh, again, I keep that folder on my desk of, of the latest uh, information when it comes to uh, benefits, quarantine requirements, isolation requirements. I encourage you to do the same so that you can refer to it. And as these issues come up, refer to those documents so that you have the latest guidance that is out there. Of course, we're available if you have any questions or concerns on that front. Okay, so that's the, the brief update on where things stand with COVID right now. It's my pleasure to introduce Teresa Rusnak. Uh, Teresa, as many of you know, is a frequent presenter here on the weekly webinar and uh, tracks many developing legislative issues here in New York and otherwise. And uh, Teresa asked to present today to everyone on a piece of legislation that she has been keeping an eye on with respect to transgender workers here in New York. So Teresa, great to have you with us. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Sandy. And hi, everyone. I think most of you probably recognize my face or my voice by now, but I'm always happy to be here with you. Um, before I get to the transgender workers, there is one question we're getting a lot. I see in the chat about the COVID sick leave. That New York State COVID-19 leave does not have an expiration date. Um, you know, to the extent the federal guidance impacts it, um, that's probably a discussion we can have offline. But as, as to the base question, that leave does not have an expiration date. And that's the New York COVID-19 leave. Um, but turning now to my topic, Kathy, if I could have the next slide. As Andy mentioned, this is legislation that has recently been passed. So on August 10th, just last week, Governor Hochul signed into law a Senate bill, and it is a law directing the New York State Department of Labor and the Division of Human Rights, so two agencies that employers in New York State deal with a lot, um, to study the employment rates of transgender people within the state. The purpose of the study is to determine whether a disparity exists between the employment rate of trans people and other residents of the state, and specifically whether discrimination is a barrier to the employment of trans people. The study will determine what changes should be made to state policies and what laws should be passed to eliminate any such disparities. Um, so basically, this is just a study at this point. This is something that the respective departments are going to undertake and report back to the governor on um, at a date that is not specified in the law. But I thought it was a good time for employers to brush up on some reminders to make sure that you're not part of the problem, perhaps leading to this disparity that I think the state is expecting to find. Um, so Kathy, if I could have the next slide. So just so we're all on the same page, and certainly this isn't going to be a be all end all type of presentation on gender identity and gender expression. That's a much longer presentation. Um, and frankly, one of my favorite ones to give. But just as a reminder for everybody listening now, transgender is a term that includes the many ways that people's gender identities can be different from the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, it's different than sexual orientation. There's a lot of different terms that trans people use to describe themselves. Sometimes it's shortened to just trans, uh, trans plus or trans female or trans male. It's always best to use the language and labels that the person prefers or asks you to use. Um, and not only is it always best to do that, it is very likely illegal not to. So Kathy, if I could have the next slide. Um, as a reminder for employers in New York, we have the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act that was passed in 2019. It adds gender identity and expression as a protected category to the New York State Human Rights Law, which is our law that protects um, employees in New York on the basis of many categories like age, race, uh, disability, and all the other protected categories we more typically think of. So uh, gender identity and expression is in that list as well. I have the legal definition for that included for you here. That's how the law defines gender identity and expression. Um, but it generally protects the way a person expresses gender through speech, dress, and behavior. Um, and the way that they identify themselves. So as a reminder to employers, you cannot discriminate against employees on either of those bases 
under New York law, if gender identity and expression aren't part of your equal employment opportunity policies or your harassment prevention policies, I recommend that you amend those and add it. Next slide, please. Um, as a reminder, we now have protections for gender identity under federal law as well. Um, this came in the form of a Supreme Court case, and I have the name for you there. Uh, but basically what happened in this case is an employee worked as a funeral director and worked as a male for several years, but then told her employer that she would be coming to work wearing women's clothing. Two weeks later, she was terminated because of the funeral home funeral home and her employer's belief that her gender identity would be upsetting to customers and that her gender identity in general was a violation of the owner of that company's religious beliefs. The Supreme Court held on June 15th, 2020, that this was illegal and thus affirmatively said that gender expression and gender identity are protected under federal law. So we now have dual protections under federal and state law. It's particularly important for employers to be aware of those and to make sure they're not discriminating against employees. Next slide, please. Um, as a reminder, because sometimes I hear, you know, she's not really trans or she's not really this or that if, because she hasn't done X or Y or Z. And so as a reminder for employers, transgender, or as we sometimes use the term gender expansive, people do not have to do any of the following to be legally protected. Uh, they don't have to change their legal name or ask to be called by a different name. They don't have to change their pronouns or have surgery or take medications, including hormones. They don't have to dress in a certain way, and they don't have to produce medical records verifying, in quotes, a transition. Next slide, please. Um, as a reminder for employers, the failure to use correct pronouns in the workplace is a violation of the New York Human Rights Law. I'm not talking about inadvertently forgetting once in a while. Uh, but the, the sustained use of incorrect pronouns has been held to be a violation of the New York human rights law. Certainly, I know the Division of Human Rights looks at it that way. Uh, failure to allow employees to use the group restroom that corresponds to their gender identity is also a violation of the New York human rights law. So you can't, as an employer, say trans employee or non-binary employee or gender expansive employee, you must use this single stall restroom you have to allow them to use the group restroom or locker room or changing room of their gender identity. Um, and then as a final reminder, employees may be eligible for an accommodation or leave if they are diagnosed with something called gender dysphoria. This is a actual medical diagnosis um, and it's based on a, a discrepancy and the physical and mental distress that that can cause between a person's assigned sex, their birth and their gender identity. If someone is diagnosed with gender dysphoria, that would be an exception of when you can ask for medical records to verify the need for any accommodation or leave that they might need. Um, next slide. Okay, and I, I think that's it. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate you having me on and I'm sure I'll be back with you all soon. Teresa, thanks for that update and, and the reminders, all very good and helpful information for our clients and friends of the firm to keep in mind. Again, Teresa's contact information and all our presenters' contact information will be available on a slide at the end of the program here. Um, I'm about to turn it over to another one of my colleagues, but we, we did, as Teresa noted, get a number of questions with respect to the impact of the CDC's new guidance, saying that Quarantining is no longer required for someone who is merely exposed to a positive case. And uh, the impact of that status and guidance on New York's paid COVID sick leave benefits. Uh, what I would tell you here is, is that this is an issue that's developing. Uh, I, I have not had occasion to look at whether the New York State Department of Health or other state officials have affirmatively adopted this guidance. Uh, but I will say typically that's where they look to the CDC is their source for what the uh, the isolation or quarantine requirements will be uh, issued out here. Uh, so this is something that you should work with your bond attorney on or other legal counsel to analyze uh, the impact of uh, that guidance decision uh, and the quarantining changes and a potential eligibility for paid COVID sick leave benefits for workers. All right, with that said, it's my pleasure to turn things over to my colleague, Frank Mayer. Uh, Frank works in our uh, 
uh, tax and um, employee benefits group. And uh, he's someone who I work with frequently on any number of issues where our practices overlap. One of those areas has been uh, remote work and the proliferation of remote work um, for, let's say, our New York-based clients now having workers potentially uh, in other states, multiple other states, and a number of compliance issues that can arise here. I'll typically work on, of course, the employment side of those issues, and I'll tell you there are any number of, of them. Frank will focus on the tax and, and corporate registration or charitable registration type issues, and wanted to spend just a few minutes with you today to, again, talk about those issues in case you are or may be dealing with these types of remote work compliance issues. So Frank, great to have you with us. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Andy. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm traveling today, so I'm coming to you uh, through my phone. If any questions do emerge or pop up on a screen, if someone could, from a, uh, could read them back to me, I'd be happy to address them. And as, as Andy said, I'm talking about one of the uh, best known but uh, well-kept open secrets, the employment of out-of-state workers. And before the pandemic, you know, many organizations had workers working remotely. I mean, it's just the reality of the way we work and live now, you know, with, with a, a limited workforce available. Employers just have to go outside the boundaries of New York State, for example, to find the for workforce that they need and the skill set that they need. So this creates a number of issues, uh, particularly for New York-based employers. So typically the issues can be broken down into four or five different categories. So I'm going to quickly run the categories and then we'll, we'll run through some of the issues in, in the, the limited amount of time that we have. So first is the, the employer registration, you know, registration as, as an employer of an out-of-state worker. The registration as a business, because the business has an out-of-state worker, that business being either a not-for-profit or let's say a for-profit corporation or LLC, uh, the, the income tax issues, the sales tax issues, and the applicable exemptions to those registrations. And then uh, the New York State withholding tax issues for out-of-state telecommuters under the wonderful New York State convenience rule. And then uh, probably going to, given the time we have a topic for another day, many employers now have employees working abroad either U.S. Uh, expatriates or uh, foreign-based persons uh, working abroad from home or at a foreign office. So first, let me turn to employer registration. So if we take away nothing from, from today, the fundamental thing that I want to leave everyone with is that wages are subject to taxation in the jurisdiction where the services are performed. It doesn't matter where the employer is based. It matters where the employee is based. If we have a New York-based employer and that worker is, is working in Des Moines, Iowa, then that's where those wages are subject to taxation. If that person is working in, in London, England, then that's where those wages at a minimum are subject to taxation because every jurisdiction wants to carve its pound of flush. So again, wages are subject to taxation in the jurisdiction where the, the worker performs the services, even if that person is sitting at home or out of state at their kitchen table in their pajamas. Um, in addition to that, the empl employee benefits like unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, uh, and other lawfully required benefits are to be re are required in the jurisdiction where the services are being performed. So. People say, well, gee, I have a person working in uh, in uh, North Carolina. Do I have to provide New York PFL? And uh, India will correct me if I say anything wrong, but the answer is, is no, generally. You provide the benefits in the state where the worker is performing services. Um, so it'll be that state's particular benefit. So many employers end up you know, as Andy mentioned, he writes a lot of good memoranda on uh, the for amendment of employers' handbooks uh, and, and, and the like, so that employers know what benefits they need to provide in those jurisdictions. The 
the tip of the iceberg being unemployment insurance workers compensation, which is typically uh, set up at the time the employer registers uh, as an employer in that other jurisdiction to withhold and deposit employment taxes. So typically those registrations are done on one form that's typically done online. Now, many employers use, um, you know, service payroll services like like ADP and, and, and the like at Paycheck, uh, and those organizations can help with the, the registration process. So that's step one, the registration as employer. But as a result of registering as an employer, that opens a, an employer up to other responsibilities and opportunities in a given jurisdiction. And, and so um, I, I would say that that would be the, the business registration, in, in some cases, the corporate income tax and sales tax registration, or in the case of the not-for-profit, the not-for-profit registration issue. So if you're a for-profit business, having an employee in the state, even a person who works in the back office, may cause the corporation, let's say, say as an example, to apportion some of its state taxable income away from New York and toward the other jurisdiction. Well, that's not all bad because maybe that jurisdiction has a lower effective corporate tax rate than New York. The, the concern is, of course, is the extra compliance and having your accounting firm prepare an additional corporate return, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna pay more tax or duplicate tax. It means that some of the income may be pulled away from, from New York and apportioned to that particular jurisdiction. Um, and again, tax exempt entities may need to uh, register and, and file uh, a, a, a UBIT tax return, unrelated business taxable income return, and some jurisdictions don't require a not-for-profit entity to register uh, for an exemption from corporate taxes or only require a filing if, if there's any unrelated business income to be reported. Um, by the tax exempt organization overall. Some states have no filing requirements. So another uh, issue is that employ having an employee in the state may create, create nexus for sales tax purposes, as well as income tax purposes or UBIT, unrelated business income tax purposes in the case of a not-for-profit organization. So if you're a tax exempt entity, uh, you know, you might have to file for an exemption from sales tax, or if you want to make exempt purchases, there may be a requirement to file. Or, and again, if you're a tax exempt entity, you may need to register with the Office of Char the Charities Bureau of that particular state with the AG or, or other equivalent government organization. Uh, and for those organizations that are licensed professionals, let's say PCs, you know, doctors, dental practices, accounting firms, those organizations, even if they are New York employers, will need to be sure that the, the professional is licensed in that state. So if you have a, uh, let's say, a, a, a psychologist counseling from North Carolina, then likely that person's gonna be, need to be licensed as a psychologist in North Carolina, even if they're providing counseling services to New York uh, patients or clients of the um, of the organization, so let's keep that in mind. Um, another issue deals with the qualification to do business in a state. So we've talked first about registration as an employer uh, to, to withhold and pay over taxes, provide benefits, registration for corporate income taxes or unrelated business income taxes, sales taxes, seeking the proper exemptions. Um, the, the next prong would be the qualification to do business in the state. Now, what I mean to qualify to do business in the state, it's, you know, if a corporation comes to New York and wants to transact business or do business, it has to be registered with the New York State Department of State because New York wants to know who's doing business in, in the state. And other states have the same set of, generally the same set of rules. So having an employee in the state may create a sufficient level of activity in the state, even if it's a back office employee, you know, an IT or an accounting person, uh, as opposed to maybe a salesperson. 
may require the registration to do business in the state. Now, the failure to qualify to do business in a state could bring could prevent the organization from bringing a lawsuit uh, in the state if it transacted business without a certificate of authority. But typically, organizations are permitted to defend themselves against lawsuits. Now, many states have imposed penalties on foreign corporations or LLCs that transact business in the state without registering. One story that I, I recall was an auto dealership that did a lot of leasing, and they had a leasing company, and they were New York-based, and they had one car that they leased to a customer in Connecticut some years ago, and they never really thought much about it. But they ended up paying a fine on a monthly basis because they weren't registered to do business in Connecticut because they leased one car to a customer in the state of Connecticut. So needless to say, the owners weren't terribly happy about that. Um, and some states, I, I understand, have gone as far as to potentially impose penalties individually on officers and directors uh, of non-compliant foreign corporations. So, you know, the end, the registration is probably, you know, $100, $150 a year. And often they typically have to have a registered agent in the state. But, you know, out of an abundance of caution, it's usually best to go ahead and register in the state just to make sure that uh, none of those jack in the boxes pop up uh, on the organization or its, or its officers. Um, and finally, um, I want to talk about the New York convenience rule, which bedevils most New York-based employers and payroll service companies, and I'll tell you why in a minute. The New York convenience rule says that a New York-based employer has an employee working out of state for the employee's own convenience as opposed to the convenience of the employer, then the days worked out of state for that out-of-state employee are considered New York work days. And so to shortcut all of this, what that means is that if an employee is working out of state without being at a bona fide employer office, that individual will end up paying tax and having tax withheld in the home state, as we talked about at the beginning of this presentation, because that's where the wages are performed. And in addition to that, New York state income tax withheld on those wages for um, even though that employee works out of state and the convenience of the employer test is based on a court case called Huckabee, a New York Court of Appeals case, the highest court in the jurisdiction of New York, uh, where Mr. Huckabee, an out-of-state uh, IT person, worked in Tennessee and spent about 25% of his time in New York. Um, but Mr. Huckabee ended up having to pay income tax on 100% of his New York income Footnote, Tennessee is one state without a state income tax, but that has nothing to do with the decision. So um, the New York State has adopted a, a policy of determining a, a facts and circumstances safe harbor test. Uh, they've published a certain factors that an employer has to meet um, in order to see if, if an employee is working out of state for the convenience of the employer as opposed to the employee's own convenience. I have yet to see virtually anyone meet those requirements, there's a primary factor that says that if you're working out of state on them, uh, at, let's say, for example, the state gives an example, an employer was an automotive company in Manhattan. Um, they had a, a, a test track in Detroit. The engineer that, that worked for the company lived in Detroit. The engineer's job was to test new cars on the track. The engineer did so on a daily basis. And New York says because that employee's primary job is to test new automobiles. Test track is there. There's no test track in Manhattan. That's uh, that's working out of state for the convenience of the employer. In absence of meeting that, there are six secondary factors and ten ancillary factors, which almost I've never seen anyone meet. Secondary factors to run quickly is that the home office is required as a condition of employment. The, the employer has a bona fide business purpose for having the employer office. The employee performs some of the core duties at the home office. Most people meet that one. The employee meets or deals with clients or customers on a continuous basis at the home office, which goes to show how dated this, this uh, statement from 2006 is, position statement from New York State, because people meet virtually now, but New York doesn't recognize that for tax purposes. 
And another one is that the employer doesn't provide space and the employer reimburses expenses for the home office, typically 80% or more of the expenses. So, and then you've got to meet, in addition to four out of six factors, three out of 10 other factors, you know, like having a separate telephone line and the like. So it's almost an impossible bar to get over and it's almost a formality to review. But many employees say, okay, um, I'm going to be smart. I'm just going to take a credit for my New York taxes on my uh, uh, on, on, that I pay um, on my local return. But most home states won't give a credit because New York has long arms and wants to reach into the estate, the state where the employee is is working. It just doesn't work that way with other taxing authorities. So employees end up paying double taxation or taking a filing position, which is unsustainable. And even if they do get away with that, New York has reached out to many tens of thousands of New York uh, of people who have moved out of New York state or work out of state for New York based employers, asking about their relationship with the New York employer. And I've helped employers with one or more letters deal with this uh, inquiries from, from employees where, who have been contacted by New York state. Um, if the New York state doesn't get the money, the tax money from the employer, the employee, it will certainly seek the tax money from the employer, which also could include seeking the money from the officers and directors of the um, employer who are in the know about the decision uh, to not withhold uh, tax on the employee. So I mentioned there was another uh, issue with uh, foreign-based employment and that many employers deal with. Uh, I'm not going to run into that today just, just because of the time we have, but uh, many of the same rules that we talked about apply to foreign-based employment, and we'll save that one for a topic of another day. Uh, if there are any questions, Andy or somebody could read those back to me. I'd be happy to address them. If not, that's all I have for you today, uh, and well, thank thanks. you for listening. Frank, thank you. I, I think you covered the, the, the questions or answered them during the course of your presentation, but um, and, and we certainly welcome you back any time to talk about some of these foreign compliance issues. Uh, I, I think for folks listening, obviously there's there's a, a, a wide swath of compliance issues that come up, uh, certainly in the tax realm, as Frank covered here, and as well as in the employment realm that you're gonna need to be mindful of. And, and I think this uh, really stems from you know, us uh, as employers when COVID hit, right? Just getting through the day, right? Getting through the week, uh, people working from home and in home was in a lot of different areas uh, across the country. And we just were getting the job done at that time. And now that's morphed into the dynamic where these remote work arrangements have proliferated, they're preferred, they're workable. And, and now we have to, and, and we're seeing clients start to dive in and examine these very important issues uh, with a remote worker who is going to operate, let's say in California or Florida or Washington. Uh, and we we do need to be proactive in addressing these issues. Fortunately, uh, we have Frank and other professionals here at the firm who can be of assist assistance if you do have questions, uh, but this is certainly not an area where you want to stick your head in the sand. So Frank, thanks so again, we, appreciate you being with us. Just one, one last comment, Andy. We always, uh, sometimes employers don't always know where their employees are working. So it's good to have a policy that requires prior written consent to allow an employee to telecommute from a from an alternate location. We like to say that the employer is always the last one to know. Yeah, th that's true. Uh, I have definitely seen that uh, be the case before that employer was surprised to learn somebody was working remotely in one jurisdiction when they thought they were uh, domestic. So thanks again, Frank, appreciate it. Pleasure, so, Randy, thank you. You're welcome. Next up, uh, I have my colleague, Jeremy Scher. Uh, Jeremy's here. He's a litigator in our uh, Rochester office. And uh, for those of you uh, in attendance here, uh, you want to talk about service of process. And in, in my realm, this comes up in, in a couple different ways with some frequency. One is where we've gotten a demand letter from uh, an attorney representing, let's say, one of our uh, former employees uh, asserting a claim, threatening to commence action. Uh, if there is a resolution, there's no resolution. So we're waiting for 
uh, that suit to get filed and processed to be served uh, on the employer and perhaps individuals. And the other where out of the blue, you got a process server walking around looking to serve and maybe even hands you legal papers and says, you've been served. Uh, so Jeremy asked to come on and talk a little bit about uh, uh, that issue uh, as maybe relevant to you and then uh, kind of use some uh, experiences of his own to illustrate the importance of this issue. So Jeremy, great to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andy. So um, service of process, which is the legal mechanism for informing a defendant that the plaintiff has sued them, is a very contrived and artificial concept that a lot of lawyers don't understand. And certainly a lot of non-lawyers don't understand because no one's breaking open the statute books and reading about how this service concept actually works. And a lot of times it does not make sense. So my theme here is going to be a pretty obvious one. If you have any doubts as to whether there's a lawsuit pending against your business, then you can reach out to us because we can find out. Um, so let me give you an example of how you can be sued and not know it. If you have a, and this also dovetails with, with, with what Frank was just talking about, getting, uh, getting authorization to do business in New York through a corporation or, a, or an LLC or an LLP. Let's say you have a business in New York and you register it as an LLC with the New York Sta uh, Secretary of State. Now, if someone wants to sue your business, all they need to do is bring the complaint and the summons to the Secretary of State in Albany, pay a small fee, and your entity, in this case an LLC, is considered served the same day that the process server gives the summons complaint to the Secretary of State, even though you have no idea that this even happened. And a 30-day clock starts running. And when the 30-day clock runs out, um, you're in default. Now, what's supposed to happen is the Secretary of State is supposed to mail the summons and complaint to the address that you have on file with the state. And again, this goes for any kind of corporate entity or association you have registered to do business in New York. So pretty much anything, a not-for-profit, an LLP, pretty much anything you've registered here. So the law allows someone to sue you through the Secretary of State. So in theory, you get the papers in the mail, you call counsel, and you appear in the case. But what's happening now, and has been happening for months, is that the Secretary of State is so backlogged in mailing out these legal papers that the 30 days elapse and the Secretary of State has never sued, I mean, excuse me, has never mailed the papers. So we are now encountering situations where defendants have been sued. They don't get the papers within 30 days and they're technically in default, um, even though they, had, they never knew and had no way to know that they had been sued. So this is a contrast to the more conventional way that you can be sued, which Andy described, where a process server walks into your company with papers and says, I'm looking for someone with authorization to accept legal papers. And this may go to a receptionist. This may go to someone who is summoned from a back office and actually is counsel for, the, for your company or an officer with authorization to accept the papers. Um, and that person may say, yes, I'm the, I'm the person with authority. I'll take the papers. And in that case, it's sort of the flip side of what I described with the Secretary of State. In that case, the clock starts running immediately as soon as the, the person accepts the papers. And the time to, to respond can be as short as 20 days. And if you don't respond within 20 days by submitting some sort of answer or response to the complaint, then you're in default. So what does that mean, being in default? Well, something that most people don't know is that if you um, are in default in certain types of lawsuits where the uh, amount that the plaintiff is seeking is stated clearly on a document, for example, a suit on a promissory note, 
I promise to pay $1 million or a suit over a contract that has a liquidated damages clause. If you breach this contract, then you must pay me $1 million. Then here's the little known fact. If I get a default against your company, I don't even need a judge to get involved. I can bring a set of papers to the Monroe County Clerk's Office or whatever clerk's office is involved in this suit, and I can get a judgment against uh, your, your company, again, without any judge ever being involved. I can enter that judgment, and then I can start serving post-judgment executions and subpoenas on your company. So how do I know this? Because I've done it. Um, I'm, I, I have a $1 million default judgment against a defendant that, that registered to do business in New York. Um, I served it through the Secretary of State. But I also sent a courtesy copy of the papers to its lawyer. And the lawyer claims that he never told his client about the lawsuit. The Secretary of State, according to this defendant, never sent the papers. And the defendant defaulted. And because we were suing uh, under a liquidated damages clause that said you owe $1 million if you breach, I didn't need to go to a judge. I got a default judgment from um, from the clerk, and the uh, the defendant hired a reputable law firm, moved to vacate the default judgment, and the judge said no because the the defendant had not met the standard to vacate a default judgment, and that standard can be um, more difficult to meet than you may think. Uh, not only do you have to show a legitimate excuse for not knowing about the case. For example, the Secretary of State never sent me the papers. But you have to lay out your defense. And while laying out your defense is not held to the same standard that it would be, say, at trial, it has to be um, has to make a showing of being meritorious. It can't just be um, a flimsy statement that, oh, I don't owe this money, or um, I, for some reason, plaintiff isn't entitled to get this money. You have to actually lay out facts that, if true, would um, support your, would create a defense. And that is not something you want to do at the beginning of the case. You do not want to lay out your defense at the very beginning before you've had a chance to investigate the case. Um, and, and in the case that I'm working on now, the plaintiff, uh, excuse me, the defendant didn't make the sufficient showing and is now trying, is still trying to lift a $1 million default judgment. Um, so so the, the two main points I want to make are, are these. One, if you have any concern that you've been sued, we'll help you. Avoiding a default once lawyers get involved is very easy. You can get an extension. You can submit an answer. You can um, make a motion. There are all kinds of things that we can do to prevent a default from occurring. What you should not do is um, be in a situation where if you hear about a lawsuit, you don't investigate. If someone says that papers were delivered, legal papers were delivered to your office, pick them up. If they say that you've been, if they're a complaint and a summons and they say you've been sued or something like that, don't waste time because the time you have to respond is shorter than you think. Um, again, it can be as short as 20 days. Um, if you believe that there's a, there's a lawsuit out there, we can track it down. In fact, you can track it down. If you go to uh, the state's the state court e-filing website, um, which you can find just by Googling the, the letters N-Y-S-C-E-F, New York State Court e-filing, you can, for free, if you sign in as a guest, look up any lawsuit that's been filed anywhere in New York that has e-filing, electronic filing, which is most counties, including Monroe County, the entire city of New York, and most other counties. Um, except the smallest ones. And that's free. You don't need to be a lawyer, but we can, of course, look for you. And if, uh, if, if someone has served the Secretary of State, then you're going to be able to find it, um, find that lawsuit online and prepare for it, even if the Secretary of State never gets it to you. 
Um, my second point is, um, if if you do hear about a lawsuit through um, through any source, it's it always pays to um, to 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 confront it rather than avoid it. Um, even if you think the lawsuit is bogus, even if you think the lawsuit is filed out of filed out of bad faith, um, avoiding it is a bad idea because a default judgment is not something you ever want to have to deal with. And my final point is because the the the, the service system is dysfunctional right now, because as I mentioned, the Secretary of State is not timely mailing out the summons and complaint. We um, businesses need to spend more attention than usual on working with counsel to understand whether they are subject to a lawsuit, whether there's something pending against them, and if so, how to address it and avoid a default. Jeremy, thank you. Very, very helpful and, and timely information. Again, this goes in the don't stick your head in the sand category, I guess, I guess our theme today, but, um, and, and obviously a great result for uh, your client in, in that matter too. Jeremy, I hope you'll come back again and talk about some more issues. Appreciate you being with us. Thank you. All righty, last but definitely not least is my friend and colleague, John Godso. John, as you know, is a frequent contributor to our program here. John works in our Buffalo office and practices in the employee benefits area. Uh, he is uh, very knowledgeable and someone I turn to all the time when these issues arise. And John is going to talk to us today, just give an update on some retirement plan issues. John, great to have you with us. Great. Thanks, Andy. Glad to be here. Appreciate when benefits is put in the uh, cleanup spot of the <laughs> guest speaking order. So Happy to talk to you today about retirement plans. And as I was doing this presentation, I thought back to my history of about 22 years in the benefits business. Initially, around 2000, the years thereafter, retirement plans was really a real focus of our world. Um, you know, most of us work in both the health and welfare space and the retirement plan space. Uh, initially, in the early 2000s, there was a lot of le uh, legislation surrounding retirement plans, regulations that we had to keep up with amending plans, thinking about how we're going to keep up with these new requirements. I would say ever since the Affordable Care Act passed, there's been a little bit of shift in the new legislation and regulatory guidance that's been provided where there's been a little bit more focus on the health and welfare side, a lot of new requirements in that area. Um, so we've tended to spend a lot of time on health and welfare plans recently. Um, certainly there's been retirement plan issues over the years, especially on the side of fiduciary litigation and keeping up with your fiduciary responsibilities, but the welfare side has been a little bit more of the on the legislation and regulatory uh, requirements side that we've had to pay attention to. So I thought today it would be helpful to talk a little bit about some recent developments on the, on the retirement plan side and, and some things that are coming down the pipeline that are being talked about in Congress and that we're likely to see in the in the upcoming months. So we go to the next slide, please. So the, the first headline here really is the extension by the IRS, recent extension by the IRS of certain uh, amendment deadlines that were normally applicable to be um, executed by December 31, 2022. Uh, this guidance came in the form of notice 2022-33, which is issued about 10 days ago. Um, and the impacted legislation here was the SECURE Act, the Miners Act, and the CARES Act. And you certainly can be forgiven if you don't recall what all these acts provided for. Um, this is really some pre-COVID legislation as well as early COVID legislation. So it's been a couple of years since uh, these laws were passed. Uh, when they came out, the IRS gave us initial amendment deadlines that was generally, and I say generally because it depended on the type of employer or type of plan you were, but generally, if you had a, a calendar year plan, which many of us do, there was a deadline of December 31, 2022. The rules differed for governmental plans and collectively bargained plans. That got pushed out to 2024 under the original rules, but mostly for your qualified plans, 403B plans, we had a deadline at the end of this year to make these amendments. 
And so the SECURE Act was really a technical piece of legislation. There were a lot of potential changes in that, including changes related to required minimum distributions. There were changes about uh, including long-term part-time employees in your 401k plan. Uh, so these changes administratively have had to be in operation since 2020, uh, but the amendment deadline was not uh, set forth until 2022. Now we get a push off from that deadline until December 31, 2025. And again, I say generally because different rules apply with respect to, in this case, governmental plans, uh, kind of complicated rules depending on the legislative session for a governmental plan of the body that has amendment authority, but they're pushed out as well. You can look at 2022-33 for those specific rules or certainly contact us if you're a governmental employer to understand exactly when your amendment deadlines are. But the headline here really is that these are being pushed out until 2025. Go to the next slide, please. So there is one important exception here though. Um, with respect to the CARES Act, and folks may remember the CARES Act as one of the initial major pieces of legislation that get issued pretty soon after uh, the COVID pandemic. One of the provisions, there were basically three parts of the CARES Act. One was a delay or an ability to delay uh, required minimum distributions that happened in 2020. Another piece was the ability to get access to your retirement account money now, even though it wasn't permitted uh, on the, under the otherwise applicable provisions of the plan. So basically in-service distribution, these were referred to as coronavirus related distributions and they could be up to $100,000. Um, and there were also loan relief provisions in the CARES Act allowed you get uh, obtain a higher loan or loan in a higher amount and also extend the repayment dates uh, for those loans. So these were all optional provisions that many of you may recall having to make a decision on back in, in 2020. These are the only pieces, the last two, the coronavirus related distributions and the loan relief provisions. These are the only provisions that are still subject to that general rule that I discussed about December 31, 2022. So keep that on your radar for those um, amendments that are required this year. Everything else, including the CARES Act provision regarding RMDs, is pushed out to the general 2025 deadline. So I know some, some plan sponsors have already amended their plans or maybe thinking about amending their plans before the end of 2022 and had that on their radar. I would say if you've already amended your plan, that, that's not a problem. The biggest issue that may happen is that as a result of later guidance, you may have to make modifications to that amendment. Um, you can do that as guidance is issued, but it's not a problem to have your plan amended already. If you haven't amended your plan and we're considering amending it in 2022, I think it depends on really your approach. Some plan sponsors, as I mentioned before, these provisions are really administratively already in place. So some plan sponsors like to make the amendment, get that amendment uh, put into their SPD so that can be communicated to plan participants regarding how the plan's being operated. If you wanna do that, that's okay as well. Just understand that you might have to make modifications to that amendment in the future, maybe modifications to that SPD, depending if that's getting changed by any subsequent guidance that we might see uh, before 2025. Uh, but it, you can also choose to delay overall amending your plans subject to the rule we just talked about with respect to the CARES Act. These are all decisions that you can make uh, in connection to your plan documents. But for most people, this is a little bit of a relief to have this uh, push out of the plan amendment uh, deadline. Many of you were probably on pre-approved plan documents and can be working with your plan providers about when those uh, amendments are going to be issued. And again, this with, with the uh, push out of the amendment date, they likely may be encouraging you to do it later on uh, in, in light of the fact that, you know, we might receive additional guidance regarding what those amendments might have to say. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So other recent developments. Um, cycle three restatements, that's really the technical term we talked about just before pre-approved plan documents. Many of us maintain uh, pre-approved plan documents. Those are documents typically that are being provided by our, our record keeper, or provider, um, the T. Rowe Price, the Vanguards of the world, the Fidelity of the, of the world. They have these pre-approved documents that get approved by the IRS, and then they push them out to their clients. Many of you probably have been through this process of getting your plans restated prior to this July 31, 2022 deadline. If this is news to you and you are on a pre-approved document, um, there are steps that can be taken. 
meaning if you've missed this July 31, 2022 deadline, um, you can utilize the IRS correction program referred to as EPCRS. It will require a filing with the IRS and, of course, the amendments to be made. Uh, there is a compliance fee associated with the EPCRS uh, submission. But if you have missed a deadline, there are steps that can be taken to put your plan back into compliance. And that uh, issue, if you missed the July 31, 2022 de deadline, dovetails into a couple of issues that we've talked about a little in the past on this program, but it's always helpful to have reminders of. This EPCRS program is really a great program for plan sponsors to utilize. Um, the IRS, as well as us practitioners, understand that um, the operation of qualified plans is complicated. Mistakes can happen. The EPCRS gives you the opportunity to either self-correct or go to the IRS and do the mea culpa. Say, hey, we had this problem. Here's our proposed correction. Here's what we're going to do. And if you do that on a self-correction basis or going to the IRS through the correction programs, you can avoid much larger penalties that may apply if the IRS finds out these problems on audit. So we always like to encourage participation in PCRS. Recently, it expanded its self-correction opportunities. In general, under EPCRS, there's two avenues, either self-correct, meaning you do it in-house, you don't have to go out to the IRS and seek their approval, or the second option is to go to the IRS, get a compliance letter from the IRS regarding the particular issue. Uh, many employers, uh, prefer for, for many reasons, the self-correction opportunity or, or avenue. And as a result of recent iterations of the EPCRS program, those self-correction opportunities are, are expanded. The ability to make retroactive amendments, for example, with respect to plan operational issues, the ability to fix issue, a common issue, which is failure to make proper deferrals under a 401k or 403b plan, for example, can be corrected under EPCRS. So I'd encourage you, if you're if you're experiencing operational difficulties, uh, to think about the EPCRS program rather than what we've talked about a few times on this program today of sticking your head in the sand and, and hoping you're not going to get that IRS audit. So speaking of IRS audits, uh, we, we have spoken about this in, on past program, the new IRS pre-examination audit program, but I thought it was worthwhile mentioning again. This is a, a new pilot program being offered by the IRS. So instead of just getting a letter saying, hey, you're being audited, uh, put together all these uh, documents for us, send it to us and expect a, an examiner to visit your office in within 90 days. Um, the IRS is now changing, at least under this pilot program, to send you a letter saying, okay, we well, are going to be under audit. Um, we will give you a 90-day period to look at your own plans, tell us, do a self-assessment if there's anything wrong with your plans or any issues with your plans, and then you have the opportunity to provide a, a proposal to make those corrections. So it's basically an opportunity for you to make the correction without potentially facing much higher fines that can happen as a result of just the audit program where they're coming in, and if the IRS finds the problem, you're, you're subject to a much higher penalty structure. So that's in place now. Again, it just goes along the lines, I think, of the IRS really wanting us as employers to make self-corrections to the extent that we find issues with our employee benefit programs. So the last two pieces I'm going to mention here today, the Inflation Reduction Act and the SECURE Act 2.0. Many of you probably read about the Inflation Reduction Act. I think it's going to be signed by Biden today. I haven't read. He might have already signed it. Uh, there really are no significant employee benefit provisions in that act that impact retirement plan sponsors. Um, what is in there that I'll just mention is additional funding for the IRS. I think it's uh, 90 billion, if I'm not mistaken, or 80 billion for the IRS, 46 of it uh, related to enforcement activities. We don't know yet how that's going to impact employer plan sponsored uh, audits. You know, we, we can only guess that it might increase that audit activity. Um, if you've been involved with the IRS really since COVID, uh, it's really had issues with respect to its audit programs and communications. And I think as a result of this additional funding, we're likely to see maybe a more robust program, uh, audit program in the employee plans world. So something just to think about when you're looking at a, uh, an issue with your plan and deciding whether to correct it or kind of roll the dice on an audit, we may be seeing more audits down the line due to this additional funding. Last, I'll just mention Secure Act 2.0. Uh, 
this is something that's been passed by the House. We'll still may see tweaks in it uh, down the road here, but it's pretty assured in some form to be finalized. I mean, many people are saying probably by the end of the year, uh, maybe effective 1123. In the Secure Act 2.0, there's provisions relating to a further increase in the required minimum distribution age to 75, uh, expanded catch-up contribution opportunities, and also, as it stands right now, provision that require automatic enrollment in, in certain plans. Uh, many of us maintain automatic enrollment in our plans now, but this would be a more broad program that adds requirements for employers. So those are some of the things that we can look at uh, or expect to see in the future. Um, always stay tuned for further developments. Certainly, if you have questions, you can call me, uh, the employee benefits attorney you work with or the bond attorney you work with, and we look forward to working with you. With that, Andy, I'll throw it back to you. Great. John, thanks for that update. Very, very helpful. Much appreciated. Uh, and I'm sure we'll welcome you back as you continue to track these issues. I'll just add $90 billion in funding to the IRS for enforcement purposes, or at least a chunk of it. That got my attention uh, right from the get-go. And once again, I think it's that uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure sometimes uh, when it comes to tax-related compliance matters. And John is a tremendous resource for those of you who are, are seeking to maintain that compliance and get out ahead of uh, issues that potentially could arise. So John, great to have you. Everyone, you'll see the presenter's contact information on this slide here. Please feel free to reach out to them or to your favorite bond attorney if you need any assistance. Sorry we ran over a bit today, but it was some important information for us to cover. We appreciate you being with us. For those of you who are clients, we appreciate you being our clients. In the meantime, be safe and be well. We'll see you soon.